Hi, everybody, and welcome to the final lecture of new material that I will be releasing and recording before the midterm exam. And assuming that you're otherwise caught up on lectures and aside video, excuse me, the assigned um, videos and readings from the previous weeks, once you've studied this lecture and once you've seen the clip of March of the Penguins, you will be about ready to take the exam. Of course, you'll want to study, and there is a study guide posted now that has a list of key terms. Now, lecture seven ended with a short summary of the terrestrial or land-based biodiversity that still survives in Antarctica, even after the opening of gateways and the formation of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current and the subsequent formation of glaciers. Today, we will be delving into Antarctica's much more varied marine life, and we'll start with some introductory ecology. Now, regarding the first lecture quiz, I've been getting some questions about when the results will be visible, and you should be able to see the results to the multiple choice questions already. Your full grade will be posted once the TAs finish grading the short answer questions, which should be within the next week or so. Now, reading assignment number one is going to be due this Sunday, and I will go over the instructions again once more on the next slide. Meanwhile, don't forget to submit lab three, a lab on plate tectonics by Friday night. It's very worth reviewing last week's material as well as looking at the presentation that the TAs have put together. And there is a little bit of information in the slides and the recording from the review session I conducted earlier this week on Monday, April 19th, that you might want to review. Now, as for the midterm, it will open on Monday, April 26th, and it will remain open until Sunday, May 2nd at 1159 PM. Once you start your attempt at the exam, you have 75 minutes to answer 50 multiple choice and true or false questions. There will not be any short answer questions. And if you have DSP accommodations for extra time, I have already set the exam so that those are incorporated into the time limit. But feel free to check with me just in case. Now, one thing I want to mention is that the exam is just one assignment you have. It is a large part of your grade. It is 17.5% of your grade overall, because if you look at the syllabus, you'll see that the midterm and final together are 35%. But it's not the end all be all. So you don't need to assign, you don't need to, you don't need to fret about it in a life or death way. Now, definitely study, definitely make sure you're prepared. But the material is very heavily drawn from the key terms on your study guide more than anything. And if you're familiar with all of those terms, you should be fine. Um, I want to mention that I have actually posted a practice quiz that is not going to count towards your final grade. However, if you take the practice quiz, you will get three points extra credit. And it's a sampling of 10 questions of the sort that you might expect to see on the final. So that's on the week five tab on Gaucho Space right now. Now, there will not be any new lectures of new material released next week. I will be recording lecture nine, which will be a review session on the midterm exam during office hours on Monday, April 26th. And um, that will actually be a chance for you to come and ask questions and watch the, and have a little bit more of an interactive um, experience. I will be recording it also, but it'll be, lecture recorded during office hours, basically. Now, I will be recording a short lecture on Wednesday, April 28th, but that will be a breather lecture that I won't be testing you on. I will, however, be spending part of lecture 10 um, reviewing some material that will probably help a little bit with lab four on rocks of Antarctica next week. So that doesn't contain anything that will be directly tested on um, for the exam, but I will, I will take the time to do a bit of an extra review session during office hours on Wednesday, April 28th on lab four for next week. Now, speaking of extra credit for those of you who have already submitted assignments, I will add the points once you are finished taking your midterm. Remember that you can submit a total of three extra credit assignments and that each one, um, you can do three per quarter and each one will add three points to your midterm. There is a colloquium occurring this Thursday on April 22nd when two grad students will be talking about their geochemistry research, uh, material that I find interesting, but a little bit esoteric. So don't worry if not every bit of it completely makes sense to you. But for those of you looking to find out what kind of research goes on in our department, this is a good chance because these are both two of our grad students. Now here again is a summary of what you need to do for assignment number one. So if you haven't already submitted reading assignment number one. It is due this Sunday, April 25th. And 
you find an article from a news source that is not scientists themselves writing about their work. So again, I've uh, a number of the articles I've had you read, um, two out of the three paleontology articles, as well as two out of the three climate articles are really good examples of pieces that you could pick to write about for this assignment. And please feel free to email me to run ideas by me if, um, if you're still trying to figure out whether an article is um, a good fit for this assignment, or if you want me to forward you some suggestions, I'm very happy to do that. And again, as you can see, I am not opposed to the articles being kind of out there as long as they are substantially related to Antarctica and as long as they are based in fact. And your response can be pretty open-ended, but you must address a few questions and you must address what was the main point of the article, what is something in the article you hadn't known about previously, and what was something in the article that was interesting to you. And you must include a link to the article. You are otherwise free to write, write about what you want. You must use complete sentences. Um, but um, the assignment on Gaucho space has a pretty exhaustive list of ways to avoid losing points. So hopefully with this and with those guidelines in mind, it shouldn't be too, it shouldn't be too difficult to get this finished. Um, but this is due before the midterm opens. So get this done before. So it's worth getting this done relatively soon, um, sometime within the next few days, because then that'll open you up to study for the midterm. Now, as for the midterm itself, I you've seen this slide before, but it will be a long Gaucho space quiz. It will open at 12 a.m. on Monday, April 26th. And then you will have until Sunday, May 2nd at 11.59 to begin your attempt and submit it. You have 75 minutes to take the exam unless you have DSP accommodations and you have just one attempt. If you run into problems with Gaucho space or with your internet connectivity going out, please email me right away. I can usually tell by the way when someone's internet went out in the middle of an attempt because it'll just show a bunch of blank answers. So um, if that happens, don't hesitate, let me know right away. I will, I, I'm very happy to look into that for you. And they will all be, all the 50 questions will be multiple choice or true or false. So this lecture that I'm about to give is the last lecture that will be covered on the midterm exam. Lectures two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight are covered. You will want to have read the paleontology and climate articles and watched the assigned clips of Frozen Planet, Walking with Dinosaurs, and March of the Penguins. During the review session on Monday, I will give some examples of questions I might ask that have to do with the assigned reading and videos. Most of the material will be drawn from the lecture slides and from the study guide. And the, the questions that, about, that refer to the movies and articles will also largely draw from lecture material. The articles and videos are something I assign to reinforce concepts we cover in class. And Again, I hope to see as many of you as possible at the review session on Monday, April 26th. Um, this is incorrect. I just realized that's that's a holdover from last from last last quarter, but it's going to it starts at it starts at 2 p.m. at the usual office hours time. I'll fix that once I put this into the once I put this into the um, upload that. So for today's lecture, the two halves flow together fairly easily, but in the first half of the lecture, I'll focus more on broader ecological concepts like trophic levels, food webs, and ecological niches. And in the second half, I'll talk more specifically about individual organisms that inhabit the Southern Ocean, like krill, penguins, and whales. So one of the first definitions we need to make is how organisms obtain hydrocarbons, or fundamentally, sugars. And all life on Earth is carbon-based life. And at some level, all life on Earth depends on hydrocarbons to obtain energy. And some organisms can synthesize hydrocarbons themselves. These organisms are known as autotrophs. And that comes from auto, which means self, like automobile. And troph means to feed. So troph kind of reminds me of feeding trough a little bit. It's I used to mis I used to actually mispronounce feeding trough, feeding troph. So, um, but if that helps associate it at all. But autotrophs generally do not need to consume other organisms to obtain hydrocarbons and thus obtain food. 
autotrophs are organisms like plants, which use solar energy, or you also have some extremophiles that use chemical energy, but in either case, they are making the food themselves. And us humans are not like this. We, like all other animals, as well as fungi and the vast majority of microorganisms are known as heterotrophs because we have to eat something else to survive. And the hetero and heterotroph means other or opposite, like the way heterosexual means to people of opposite genders being together. So in its simplest, in its simplest explanation, hydrocarbons are synthesized inside of the cells of plants or other photosynthetic organisms. Remember that in plants, the chloroplasts in their cells, which are actually the cyanobacteria that the cells have absorbed, are the ones doing it. And the hydrocarbons are synthesized from carbon dioxide and water. Oxygen is actually produced by photosynthesis as a waste product. But if you look here, you'll see that oxygen is used up in cell respiration. And plants do actually also need to perform cell respiration. They use oxygen to break up the hydrocarbons that they feed on to make energy. And when plants need to process and eat the hydrocarbons they store, what they're doing is known as aerobic cell respiration. They're using oxygen to break down the glucose. They are obtaining energy and creating water and carbon dioxide again as waste products. And humans and other cell excuse me, humans and other animals and other heterotrophs perform aerobic cell respiration. We use the oxygen to, we use the oxygen to react with hydrocarbons and obtain energy from them, but we don't do photosynthesis. And that's why plants are important. They can create and store food and also eat it. We can only really eat the food. We can't really create it ourselves. And we need oxygen to do this. Oxygen is necessary for cell respiration with the exception of a handful of groups of extremophiles that have evolved to produce food without it. And this applies to plants, this applies to land animals, this applies to ocean animals. And it's one reason why I frequently mention dissolved oxygen when talking about ocean water and why it's important that Antarctic bottom water is um, bringing lots of dissolved oxygen to the seafloor because fish and other marine organisms need oxygen for cell respiration also. And when people wonder why the dinosaur extinction was so devastating, the extinction in which the asteroid um, wiped out most dinosaurs and a lot of other organisms, I bring up the fact that it had a lot to do with sunlight because very little life on earth can survive without the sun. Plants and other photosynthetic organisms need solar energy to drive the reactions that create hydrocarbons and the asteroid impact threw up enough dust to create a noticeable difference in the amount of solar energy that was reaching the Earth's surface. That dust, a lot of dust was thrown in the air and it stayed, in, it stayed suspended in the atmosphere quite, for quite a while. And even though we're dealing with little dust particles, the cumulative effect still very heavily reduces the amount of solar radiation that is available to plants. And so a lot of the plants simply can't make enough food and they die. This means that heterotrophs like the herbivorous dinosaurs also die off and that resulted in the upper level, um, what the, the primary carnivores, the, um, the meat eating dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex also going extinct because their food source died out. Now, um, the only organisms that would not have been affected very much at all are those living in the handful of environments where energy production is dominated by reactions with inorganic chemicals such as iron or sulfur and not photosynthesis. And chemosynthesis is the process of producing food using energy from inorganic chemical reactions as opposed to using solar energy. And this is practiced only by a few extremophiles like those that live at black smokers. And the black smoker environment is one of the few chemosynthetic environments there where you have a lot of complex organisms. There is enough food produced from all of these chemical, from, from the chemical reactions that you get these large mats of the microorganisms and then larger organisms like crabs, shrimp, tube worms, and deep sea fish feed on the bacterial mats. Um, the black smokers were quite a discovery when they were found because the deep ocean is generally a very desolate place. The only food that comes to the deep ocean is usually just what's falling out 
of the upper layers of the water as marine snow. But then they discovered these astoundingly diverse places that were full of life where you had these black smokers. They're, they're sort of little oases on the seafloor. But for our purposes, most energy comes from the sun because it does and because we won't really get much into black smokers for this class. So the amount of food available in the system is going to depend on how much food the autotrophs are producing. And that's going to be dependent on how much solar energy is available. This will be important in Antarctica because you have to consider the fact that Antarctica is in darkness for a lot of the year. And when Antarctica is in darkness, autotrophs can't photosynthesize. So there is a way to actually measure how much food is being produced. And that is known as primary productivity. And primary productivity is the amount of organic material for a given area or ecosystem that is being synthesized by photosynthesis, or in some cases, chemosynthesis. And it determines how many starting nutrients are available for other organisms. Basically, plants, basically how much food plants produce determines what is available to eat in general. And primary productivity is going to be dependent on factors such as the availability of sunlight or the, amounts of, the amount of nutrients present in a system because plants do need nitrogen and metals to grow. And it is measured, primary productivity is measured as a unit of grams of carbon, which is usually calculated from plant biomass, produced per unit area per unit time. So a common way to measure it is grams of plant biomass per meter squared per year. So the amount of, the amount of growth that occurs per, an, per unit area over a space of a year. And any food web for any ecosystem is going to be dependent on primary productivity of whatever the autotrophs are. And on land, the autotrophs are going to be plants, like trees, shrubs, flowers, grasses. Now in the ocean, we do have, you do sometimes have what look like underwater forests. You have kelp forests and you have seagrass growing, excuse me, you have seagrass growing. But especially out in the open ocean, the autotrophs are usually phytoplankton, little single-celled um, algae floating around in the water. And we'll talk more about them on the next slide. And the fascinating thing about ocean food webs is that the survival of even the largest whales in the ocean is dependent on the abundance and the health of these tiny plankton, of these tiny phytoplankton. And that's really something to consider. Just the, that the food web is dependent on organisms that we can't really see with the naked eye. Now, the relationship between an organism and another organism that it eats is a trophic relation. And that again comes from the term troph. And while a, sim a simple food chain or pyramid can be used to simplify, for an entire ecosystem like the Antarctic marine ecosystem, or as another example, a rainforest ecosystem or a North American grassland ecosystem, it is usually more useful to construct a food web, which shows how some organisms might eat both plants and other animals. And they would thus be feeding at different levels, different levels, different trophic levels. If you follow the arrows, you can see how whales are dependent on eating organisms that feed on the phytoplankton, either immediately. Um, if you follow the arrows, you can actually see that baleen whales directly feed on krill, which are the herbivores. Krill eat phytoplankton, and the baleen whales actually eat krill. But you also have a bunch of cases where this occurs up the chain. You have krill eating phytoplankton, and then um, seals or fish eat the krill, and then penguins eat the fish, or orca whales eat the crab eater seals. And in some cases, orca whales eat the penguins as well. In fact, that's the interesting thing. The orca whale is what's considered a top predator, and it eats both, it, eats, it feeds at a number of different trophic levels. It'll eat both the fish, which mostly eat krill, which are herbivores. Um, it'll also eat penguins, which are carnivores. The penguins are feeding on the fish, which feed on the krill. But it is usually pretty easy to tell which animal is going to be the top predator, which, which eats the most, most meat, basically, because it's going to be put at the top of the food web. Of course, there's not going to be very many of the organism that is at the top of the food web. 
the population density of orcas is pretty small because as we'll find out, it's actually pretty hard to get an effective amount of energy by just eating meat or by mostly eating meat. And really, you'll notice that the herbivores or the organisms that actually feed directly on the autotrophs are tiny. They are krill and other plankton. And that's something really fascinating about marine organisms. You don't have large plants being present most of the time. And so you also don't have a lot of large herbivores like the way that you would have cows or elephants on land. So let's talk a little bit about plankton. Plankton is a term that refers to an organism's lifestyle. And an organism that can be classified as plankton lives in open water, drifts with the current, and cannot freely swim by itself to a strong degree. So fish, which live in the open water but can swim against currents, are instead known as nectonic organisms. Now, most plankton are microscopic, but jellyfish, which can barely propel themselves against the current, are also technically considered to be plankton because they can't really swim against the current. But most plankton are tiny. Most plankton um, are microscopic organisms, and a single drop of seawater is full of thousands or even millions of microscopic organisms. Plankton are classified into two groups, depending, um, once again, based on feeding style, but also a little bit on um, cladistic definition, like what type of organism they are. And a phytoplankton is a plankton belonging to any of the various groups that photosynthesizes. But phytoplankton are often known as plant plankton, even though they are not technically plants. Meanwhile, zooplankton are any plankton, which are usually tiny animals that must eat other organisms, and usually the other organisms that they eat are the phytoplankton. So zooplankton include a wide variety of different groups. They include krill, which we'll talk about more. They also include various mollusks and worms. Often the young or the larva of organisms like snails, corals, or even fish live as plankton for part of their life cycle. And yes, Sheldon plankton from SpongeBob is indeed a copepod, which is one type of crustacean, the group that includes crabs and lobsters, that is a plankton. Um, and they do indeed have one eye. They're some of the only organisms that do, which is strange. Um, one eye doesn't really give you much of depth, per depth perception. That's why most organisms have two eyes or, or more. But copepods don't have great eyesight to begin with. They just have a sensor for light. Anyhow, phytoplankton are the plants of the ocean. Essentially, um, even, if that's, even if they're not technically in the same group as land plants. And they are microscopic, but collectively they make up most of the biomass in the ocean at any given time. There are going to be tons and tons of them. They're just microscopic and spread out. And biomass is useful to measure primary productivity. It can also be used as a proxy for biodiversity, or at least correlated to it. If you, there's a good chance that if you have a lot of biomass of phytoplankton, you have a good variety of them present. If there is a smaller biomass of phytoplankton, there will end up being a less diverse and abundant variety of ocean life since there will be less food to feed on. And since there is less food available to begin with, some of the organisms that are at higher trophic levels on the food web won't be able to survive as well. And I've mentioned a couple times already that phytoplankton are not plants. The funny thing is that many of the groups of phytoplankton are not all that closely related to one another. They are grouped together because of their lifestyle. They're all plankton that don't really swim and they photosynthesize. And it's sort of similar to how krill and snail larvae are both considered zooplankton because they're both not free swimming animals that eat phytoplankton. But at least they're all animals. Animals are actually all somewhat closely related to one another. Um, some of the groups of phytoplankton are about as different from one another as animals are from fungi. So you have a number of different varieties of phytoplankton, like diatoms, dinoflagellates, and foraminifera, and they're all quite different from one another. They all have different, they all have different cell shapes. They have different shells. One thing we'll find out and talk about more is that many of these plankton actually incorporate calcium carbonate or the mineral calcite into their cell walls. And in some of the articles that I've had you read where you've been, where they've mentioned um, talking where they've mentioned studying seafloor carbonates, that carbonate often came from the, rem from the remnants of these phytoplankton. 
particularly foraminifera. You might have seen the name foraminifera pop up in a couple of these articles. And they are, the interesting thing really is that the producers in the ocean are much more diverse than on land. On land, plants are all members of the same phylogenetic group, but you have a wider diversity of organisms in the ocean, providing the base of the food chain. So let's simplify a little bit and talk about trophic levels and energy pyramids. If you take a single linear example, like if you follow one of the arrows from organism to organism in the previous slide, you start out at the lowest trophic level or the bottom of the food chain. And that is where the producers, labeled here as the plants, are actually using sunlight to synthesize food. One trophic level above that are the herbivores. And these are the heterotrophs that are feeding on the producers. On land, that would be an animal like a squirrel or a cow. In the ocean, that is usually going to be zooplankton, the little krill and fish larvae and other tiny organisms that are feeding on the phytoplankton. Then there will naturally be fish and other creatures that want to eat the krill and the, and the plankton. So the primary carnivores are going to be the little fish that eat the krill and the zooplankton, but also some surprisingly large animals. As we'll learn, some types of whales, like blue whales and minke whales, in fact, many of the largest whales, feed most heavily on krill. They are actually primary carnivores because they're eating the herbivores. Now, the fish that eat the krill are preyed upon by penguins as, as well as orcas and seals. And those penguins and orcas and seals are considered to be secondary carnivores because they are eating animals that also survive by eating another animal. Now, orcas and leopard seals also prey on penguins and they are thus considered to be top or apex predators because of this. Um, they might be considered tertiary carnivores because the leopard seal is eating a penguin, which is a secondary carnivore because it is eating fish that are directly feeding on the krill, excuse me, on the, on the krill, which are feeding on the plankton. And really most animals that you can see in the ocean are carnivores to some extent, except for some really tiny fish. Um, a way to think about it is that even the meat eats meat in the ocean. And one reason why this happens is that you actually tend to have higher biological productivity in the oceans. There is enough, there is enough food present for there to be third level carnivores in some cases. Not very many of them, again, but some. Now, why are there not going to be very many orcas? Carnivory is somewhat inefficient. Eating meat is somewhat inefficient because eating another organism in general is marked with energy inefficiency. When solar energy reaches the earth, and again, remember that actually the amount of solar energy, excuse me, the amount of solar radiation being released by the sun, only a small fraction of that is reaching the earth. But even considering that, plants, plant, so the amount of total available solar radiation is not that large compared to the amount that the sun is actually putting out. And then plants can only use a small percentage of that effectively. Um, now, it turns out that there is a lot of waste and energy loss when an animal eats that plant. When krill eat phytoplankton or when a human eats an apple, at most 10% of the energy stored in that bit of plant matter will actually be successfully converted into energy that the consuming organism like the krill or the human eating the apple can use. And it's often less than that, 10% is a maximum. What this means is that only 10% of the possible energy present in, in, in an organism is transferred from one trophic level to the next when another organism eats that organism. So if a whale eats krill that ate phytoplankton, the whale is getting 10% of the energy in that krill. And if that krill only obtained 10% of the possible energy it could have obtained from the phytoplankton it ate, that means that fundamentally, the whale is only getting 1% of the energy originally produced by the phytoplankton. Logarithmically, the amount of energy goes down and down and down as you go up to higher levels. This is why whales have to eat so much krill, and this is why carnivores like orcas have to eat so many animals to survive. 
And it's why there are so few top predators in a land-based environment like wolves, as well as in an ocean-based environment like orcas. The top carnivores need to eat a lot of meat to survive, especially if they're eating animals that also eat meat. And that's often the case in Antarctica. You have orcas and leopard seals that eat penguins, that eat fish, that eat krill. And there aren't going to be a lot of orcas and leopard seals as a result of that. And they also do eat fish. Um, they also do eat fish. Um, they sometimes feed at lower trophic levels because that's more energy efficient. Even the top predators often will feed, um, they'll feed on both higher level carnivores, like orcas will attack penguins and crab eater seals, but they'll also eat fish. Kind of the same way that humans humans will feed at different trophic levels by eating plants as well as also eating meat. Now, I have mentioned that ocean productivity is often higher than land-based productivity. And there actually, if you looked at the food web before, there are a lot of secondary and tertiary carnivores living in Antarctica. So why is this? It turns out that for part of the year, Antarctica is extremely biologically productive in the oceans. And this interestingly enough has to do with the fact that Antarctica is in darkness for so much of the year. Now in the winter, photosynthesis in the Southern Ocean completely grinds to a halt and the autotrophs go dormant. Thus nutrients that would normally be used up accumulate in the water. You don't have anything growing so the nutrients just kind of sit in the water unused. And in fact, Antarctic waters are unusually rich in nutrients because North Atlantic deep water, which is the equivalent to Antarctic bottom water that forms in the Arctic, the North Atlantic deep water actually upwells near Antarctica, bringing a lot of oxygen with it and lots and bringing lots of nutrient with it as well. And a lot of this is because the nutrients carried by North Atlantic deep water have been just sitting down in the deep ocean where there isn't a lot of life and there's also no sunlight. And so they don't really get used up. So throughout the winter, the North Atlantic deep water brings nutrients and nutrients just accumulate in the oceans surrounding Antarctica during the winter because there's no sunlight and so photosynthesis doesn't really happen. As soon as the sunlight returns, the phytoplankton go into overdrive and there is a rapid boom in productivity. Um, this is an Arctic example, as you can see that this is showing summer as being in the June, in June and July, but it's a similar situation up there. Diatoms are one type of phytoplankton and this shows that as the sunlight returns, the population of diatoms explodes and the population of the zooplankton, the little plant eating animals that um, feed, on the, feed on the phytoplankton, that explodes afterwards. So in Antarctica, this increase in zooplankton biomass would also include krill. And when the krill explode in population, then you get fish feeding on them as well as whales migrating to Antarctica to feed on them. And you have a lot of food available all of a sudden. And the interesting thing about and I mentioned that prime, that productivity is often measured by biomass. And this diagram does a nice job of illustrating that. You just get a lot more, you get a lot more biomass of these phytoplankton present all of a sudden because sunlight is available all of a sudden and they can start making more food. And that ultimately means that there is a lot of food from all of the unused nutrients that had accumulated during the dark winter. There is a boom in productivity in the summer when suddenly the sunlight becomes available again and the previously dormant phytoplankton can photosynthesize again. And the fact that whales migrate has a lot to do with this. Some residents of the Southern Ocean like humpbacked whales are only part-time dwellers. Humpback whales will feed in the Southern Ocean during the austral summer when you have sunlight and when you have lots of phytoplankton and thus lots of zooplankton, including krill, which are the main Thing that most of these whales feed on actually. But when the sunlight begins to vanish, the humpback whales will head back towards the tropics to breed and raise their young. The migration allows the whales to take advantage of the food boom in Antarctica during the winter, but then they swim to warmer, gentler places to rear their babies. And the humpback whales that we see in California are undertaking a similar journey. They are passing between their equatorial breeding grounds and their summer feeding grounds in the Arctic. Now, sea ice is very important to Antarctic marine ecology. 
I mentioned that the phytoplankton go dormant, and during the winter, the phytoplankton essentially stays frozen in the sea ice. They're trapped in the sea ice when it freezes. Some algae also just lie dormant on the underside of the ice. This is actually extremely beneficial for young krill. With no active growth occurring, they don't have much food for the winter, but krill can survive the winter by actually eating the phytoplankton on the underside of the ice and eating the phytoplankton that's trapped in the ice. The krill basically have a nursery. They have a place, they have a safe place where they can eat and just kind of wait out the winter. When the ice melts in summer, the algae are released and suddenly have 24 hour daylight and a lot of nutrients available to them. So the productivity boom begins with the melting of the sea ice. The Antarctic food web as it is depends on the formation and melting of sea ice and the life cycles of krill and phytoplankton and many other Antarctic organisms are on some level linked to the sea ice cycle of melting and forming. Remember that sea ice is not the permanent ice shelf. Sea ice is just the ice that forms on the surface of the ocean water um, with more of it being present in the winter and less of it being present in the summer. Something we'll talk about when we get to climate change is how the thinning sea ice is hurting the population of krill because it's taking away this important nursery for the young krill to live in. The last term I want to introduce before we get to specific organisms is pelagic versus benthic. And there is quite a variety of interesting marine life in Antarctica. One way to categorize them is by where in the ocean they live, whether they live in the open water or whether they live on the seabed. Those that live on the, those that live in the open water, whether they're plankton or free swimming nectonic fish or seals are known as pelagic organisms. And it, Pelagic makes me think of the word pelican, and pelican feed on pelagic fish. Um, I don't know if that word association will help, but that pops into my mind. And those animals that live on the sea bottom are benthic organisms, and that's going to include coral, sea stars, crabs, and other non-swimmers. And the benthic organisms of Antarctica are really interesting. Many of them are blind because they live in complete darkness for much of the year, or they live under ice shelves that block a lot of, uh, the, sun, of the sunlight out, even during the summer. Many of them are also noted for gigantism, which is seen, which is an adaptation for cold water. And some scientists also think it has to do with them getting more oxygen. And the Antarctic waters are full of dissolved oxygen, both from Antarctic bottom water sinking and also from the North Atlantic deep water upwelling. So the you get these really beautiful gardens of undersea creatures almost. And um, the second half of this lecture will begin with talking a little bit about the different types of organisms that live on the seafloor and then moving into a, a sort of a who's who of what types of animals live in Antarctica in general. So look forward to that during the second half of the lecture.